And if you're able to stand with us, we'll invite you to do so as we sing together. 433, since I have been redeemed. Amen? All right, join in on that first verse as we sing together. Number 433, since I have been redeemed. On that first verse. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed. Of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a Christ that satisfies since I have been redeemed. To do His will my highest price since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a witness bright and clear since I have been redeemed, dispelling every doubt and fear since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. Let's bow our heads together as we look toward in prayer. Father, we come tonight. Again, we thank you for the blessings of the day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be able to come together around your word tonight. We would pray once again, you allow your Holy Spirit to bring comfort, challenge us, correct us. I pray, Lord, that you would be with each one tonight. Give a special blessing for being here. And those, Lord, that could not be with us tonight, we pray for strength and encouragement where it may be needed. And we pray again, Lord, in advance that you take all the requests that are already on our list and those that we'll share tonight and that your will be done in each one. And uh, we pray, Father, that as we leave from this place, that we will look back and say it's been good to be in the house, Lord, that you met with us. Now, we just pray that you guide direct in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. And uh, just a quick announcement or two here. Don't forget, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. We'll be celebrating with our ladies. And uh, we've got a gift for each of our, our moms. And we'll look forward to emphasizing a little bit for our ladies on Sunday. And uh, <clears throat> I was kind of kicking around, you know, there's a lot of places now they are not having Mother's Day anymore. Uh, now it's just uh, a birthing people day. So it's, if you're a birthing person, and uh, you, can, you can have a special day now, I guess. Okay? Anyhow, <clears throat> I, I don't want to get too far off track here tonight. So, <laughs> But on the, on the serious side again, uh, do be in prayer for our services on Sunday and invite someone out. Invite a mom or a sister or a, a special lady, someone you know that uh, you can encourage to come be in the house of God for, like to recognize our ladies that day. Amen? And, um, and then coming up to the end of the month, we will be uh, having uh, dinner on the grounds for Memorial Day weekend for that Sunday. Mark your calendar for that. And uh, we we'll look forward to having a good time of fellowship uh, here on that day. And uh, I think, for the most part, that's all we need to do today. Uh, just a quick praise. A couple of folks already asked me 
a little bit ago how uh, things went. I had a doctor appointment uh, yesterday. Uh, went pretty good. Uh, thankful for your prayers. Um, and then also one today for Grandma, uh, my mom. And uh, we were able to, to get uh, uh, some things settled a little bit on that. And uh, praise the Lord, doctor was very helpful and so forth. So we're kind of, I feel like we're going, still going forward, which is a good thing. Amen. Uh, so keep that in prayer if you would. Uh, next week, I go back on Tuesday to the cardiologist for a follow-up from uh, my procedure about a month ago when they did the uh, implant for the recorder. Uh, and the, uh, they called a implantable cardio monitor. Amen. And so uh, that we, we go back to the doctor on that next Tuesday. Also, I guess I'll jump in for Rena. Uh, had a good visit on Tuesday also to the doctor. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, she'd been waiting for a while to get into a uh, new PCP. And uh, they called up the other day and said, hey, we have an opening. If you can come in. It was about a month, two months early, I think, before the original appointment. They said, well, we'll see you later, end of May or whatever it was. And uh, praise the Lord, got her in on Tuesday. Had a good uh, meeting with the doctor on Tuesday and uh, was able to uh, get some good things covered there and looking at, at some tests that actually she'd been trying to get done um, for a while, and now it looks like that will happen. And so, uh, uh, and, and as we talked a little bit about it, it's good that this new doctor is actually coming in from a different perspective and kind of looking at things just a little bit different. So instead of just going through the same old tests every time and just coming up with the same result, and still having problems, it's like, well, let's take a look at something else, and let's try from this angle. And so, uh, praise the Lord, uh, maybe maybe there'll be some uh, ongoing help there and, and some uh, things for Rena. So keep that in prayer. That, I thought that was a pretty good uh, outcome of that meeting on Tuesday also. So praise the Lord for that. Um, and I did mention to you the other day, ask you to continue to pray for Pastor Williams, if you would, and uh, that uh, for direction there for future treatments and stuff for his cancer. Also for uh, Brother Anderson, I ask that you pray for him and Miss Robin. Uh, I was going to try to get a hold of him today and talk a little bit before church tonight, but uh, just did not get a chance to do that yet. But I know that uh, we've been kind of keeping each other on the on prayer list back and forth, and so I'd like for you to remember to pray for the Andersons, if you would. And um, also uh, a special meeting. Um, we had down here for um, uh, help me, um, Jesse. I guess it was Jesse, right? Was having a special meeting, so uh, need need some still prayer there for the Healy's and direction, um, and then also um, let's see. Had another unspoken. Oh, this is for Peggy. Peggy had the other day asked prayer for Pat Habedank. And I, we haven't heard any update on that yet, so pray for Pat. And obviously some surgery coming forward here. All right, anybody else? Any other prayer requests or anything tonight? We'll go ahead and double check here. I know we had several before, but anybody got anything tonight to add to it? Okay, any prayer requests? Are you just kind of waving at me down there, sweet pea? Okay, are you just, you got a prayer request? What's that? For your tooth? Okay. Pray for peanut. Uh, I'm sorry? Oh, she's got a wiggly tooth. Trying to get a straw holder, huh? Ah, okay. All right. Pray for peanut there. She's got a loose tooth. And it's got a little bit of a wiggle there. Okay. All right. And William, you got a prayer request, buddy? Oh, blister on your foot. Okay. All right. Pray for William, for his foot. Okay. For daddy. And praise the Lord, the tractor's working. Amen. Life is better in the fast lane with the tractor working now. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Uh, who's over here? Lauren, go ahead. For your knee. Okay. 
All right, Lauren has a prayer request here for her knee. Okay. And how is uh, Mrs. Spahn? Is she feeling better? She was sick. We had her on a prayer list, right? She she better? Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else as we go back around here? Miss Terry. Who's, is, is it her husband or the son's wearing it? The son, okay. Okay. Wow, okay. All right, so pray for Tom. Uh, we had Gloria, uh, Tom and Gloria's son. We just had him as their son last week. His name also is Tom. And uh, he's having a heart issue there and they have him actually it sounds like a defibrillator vest they, they got it on so it's a vest type thing and if he has a issue that vest will kind of do the same thing as a defibrillator it'll put get his heart back in rhythm or whatever okay all right pray for tom there also for carl and birdie uh, carl's test came back his six-month test was clear birdie for meds and also their son okay you had another important a very important <laughs> Denim's very important meeting, right? That might have been the other one I had down here. Just I just had a meeting, so okay, and that that's coming up this next Monday, right? All right, pray for Denim meeting on Monday. Okay, and special I'm spoken for. Terry also. All right. Okay, anybody else here per request? I'm going to come back around. All right, back over this way. Joe, yes, sir. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, being able to see some of the things that are coming down through the Supreme Court and uh, hearings. Obviously, right now they're still all in negotiating back and forth, talking all that. But it is kind of fun to watch the the liberal who've lost their minds and just uh, their heads are exploding, you know. And at this point, it's just a lot of talk yet because they haven't finalized anything. But they are just so, 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 so afraid that maybe somebody might get to talk about it. So, and I think that if they the whole idea is, is that they'll open up the whole dialogue. Then once folks start talking and finding out what actually happens, they may not want it. So, um, and actually, for those that are saying, and they don't have it all right either, uh, they're saying that the court is going to um, do away with abortion, and that's not it at all. What they're doing is they're going back to 1972 when the courts actually made their own legislation. And they're saying, we're going to throw that out. It was wrong for them to do that in 72. And so what the Supreme Court is doing, they are going back and fixing their mistake. and Saying, according to the Constitution, there's no federal constitutional right for abortion. And they're taking it back to the states. They're saying, you know what? The states have to have their legislatures decide what you're going to do in each state. And so it, it takes it back to the people of each state then to vote upon what they want in that state. That's the way it was really supposed to be designed all along, in the sense of saying the federal government isn't supposed to be 
you know, this great nanny state taking care of everything. So anyhow, so there's an interesting debate going on. And uh, there are those who just, they, they're, they're in a meltdown, absolute meltdown. <laughs> Because they're saying all kinds of things are happening and it's not happening at all. So, but again, when you can come and, and get everybody upset with a lot of fear, um, it is also kind of interesting that they decided to somebody's leaked this information out of the out of the uh, Supreme Court just before the election. Interesting. So, time will tell a little bit more on the story there. I do have a highly interesting, if anybody did not get to hear Mark Lavelle, uh, who is a, a very conservative, um, how do I want to say, it? attorney, lawyer, worked under the Reagan administration, and uh, has done a lot of writing extensively, uh, has his own uh, tel television and radio broadcast. If you missed his comment, it's about a four-minute uh, statement he makes on the leaking of this information from the Supreme Court and the so-called uh, truth and uh, what's the other word I'm looking for, Dis, uh, disinformation uh, board. It was announced the other day that Mayorkas, who is the head of the Homeland Security, is starting the own tr their own truth board to make sure what is truth? Well, that's all fine and good, except for who decides what's truth and what's not. So basically, it's another form of silencing opinions that you don't agree with. Um, if you hadn't heard Mark Levin on his statement, he hits it right na nail on the head. I have a copy of his little speech if you'd like to hear it. So uh, quite, quite telling and right on spot. Amen. Anyhow. Joe is right, though. It is a blessing. And what really is funny, I, I heard, uh, uh, I just lost her name, uh, uh, the senator up in uh, Ship, Massachusetts, Delaware. Oh, I'll get her here in a minute. She was trying to be president. Elizabeth Warren, thank you. I couldn't think of her name. All of a sudden, I just drawn a blank. She, she was, she, I thought she was going to have a heart attack. She was just like, these people have been trying for decades to do this. I'm like, you know, it would be interesting if the news covered it at all, but the longest running demonstration event in our nation every year is the March for the Right to Life. It takes place every year. One of the biggest events they have in Washington every year, but you hear nothing about it. It's been going on for years, decades. And so, uh, anyhow, I don't want to get too far distracted here, but, but as Joe said, this certainly needs, needs a lot of prayer there. Let's continue to pray that the Lord will uh, honor the efforts there and, and uh, certainly see the Lord work there. <clears throat> okay. All right. Anybody else? Uh, any other prayer requests, testimony? Any other things here? Ms. Terry, yes. Mm-hmm. All right, pray for one of the nurses there. Her name is Chris. And uh, just so happens that her husband is at Friendship Ridge right now. He's, I think he's there for therapy and whatnot, right? If I, I think he said So they both need a lot of prayer physically and whatever's going on. Okay. All right. Pray for Chris and her husband and uh, extra strength there. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Any prayer, prayer, prayer requests? Yeah. Rachel, how about you uh, checking online? We're good back here. Okay. That was a thumbs up. Okay. I, I couldn't quite see you. Sorry. There's a shadow there. All right. Very good. Well, let's do this. Let's go ahead and sing another song. And... Um, we're going to go back in our songbook to number 443. 443.
443. 443. Sunshine in my soul. Amen. There's sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. There's sunshine. Sunshine in my soul. Amen. <clears throat> Number 443. All right. <clears throat> if you're able to stand with us one more time, we'll have you sing with us tonight. Number 443. Sunshine in my soul. Help me out as we start out on that first verse. There is sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. For Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine. When the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today, a carol to the King. And Jesus, listening, can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul. There is springtime in my soul today. For when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart. The flowers of grace appear. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll, when Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love. Blessings which he gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows, <coughs> there is sunshine in my soul. Amen. Remain stand for a word of prayer. Apologize, I got a little cough there. <coughs> I was hoping to get through the song before I had to do that. <clears throat> I'm going to ask Joe to lead us in a word of prayer. As the Lord will lead you, Joe, if you would please. I appreciate that. <coughs> Dear Jesus, thank you for this Wednesday night. Thank you for all the blessings of today, Lord. Thank you for um, the clouds and uh, the nice cold temperature. And uh, please, Lord, just be with the different prayer requests we have. Please with Pastor Anderson with his uh, physical needs. Um, uh, please be with uh, Pastor uh, Williams, too, with his needs. Um, uh, please be with uh, Terry's brother and uh, her family. And please be with Denim um, with his uh, meeting coming up. And uh, uh, please be with a little uh, with the children here with their uh, special uh, uh, prayer requests. And, uh, thank you for them, Lord. And, um, uh, and please, Lord, be with our country. Please be with our uh, judges and our uh, legislatures. And uh, uh, please work in their hearts, Lord. And um, please be with us tonight uh, as uh, we hear hear your word. And please be with the pastor. And please give him the uh, words you need us to hear. And help us just to meditate on your word throughout the week in your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. <coughs> Excuse me. 
<laughs> a couple of the meetings that I failed to mention that uh, here coming up. Um, Brother Cody has a work day uh, scheduled on Saturday, May the 14th, I believe it is, over at the Fernwood Christian Camp. I believe that's the right date if I have it off the top of my head, 14th. May 14th, if you're available to help out, that would be a wonderful thing. Not this Saturday, uh, but next Saturday, a week from this Saturday. And then also, um, you might remember last year I went to the 40th uh, anniversary of the graduating class there of Maslin Baptist College. And uh, Sherry and I graduated there in 1981, so it was 40 years ago last year. And um, I was talking to um, Brother Decker, who is the Dean of Students there at Maslin, and they're trying to organize and get some people that were previous graduates from the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years type thing uh, for this year coming up, and uh, trying to locate a few fellows and different ones that are missing in action, and trying to gather some folks up for the meeting again this year. Um, but the reason I brought it all up, they have a Bible conference that they will be doing on Thursday and Friday. <clears throat> and then uh, the uh, fellowship meeting uh, and graduation on Friday uh, of uh, the 12th and 13th. So I, I brought all that up to ask you to pray for that special service. It's always a special time for the graduates and also the staff. And this last year was pretty hard on, on the, the staff there. Uh, they lost two of the professors there to uh, COVID deaths. Uh, Brother Terry Wyrick, who we've had in our church here before, a number of years ago. Brother Wyrick uh, was one of the uh, professors there, and also uh, Brother Gary Forney. And uh, Brother Gary and his wife were missionaries up in the North uh, Arctic area for many, many years, started the uh, Points North uh, Baptist Mission. And then uh, when Brother Morrison came on staff there at, at uh, Brother Snow's Church at Calvary, they began the All Points Baptist Mission, kind of overseeing a lot of the mission work as a whole. And uh, recently when Brother Forney went home to be with the Lord, they're kind of incorporating a lot of those things and molding it together and kind of working through all this of uh, Brother Forney's absence and uh, trying to do a lot of the work that Brother Forney was doing prior and uh, same thing then goes true with college. Uh, when you have two professors that aren't, aren't any longer on the staff, uh, then that means you have a little bit of a void there. Brother Decker has been picking up a lot of classes and helping teach a lot of extra stuff. And then one of the other gentlemen, uh, one of the other pastors, uh, went in for a medical procedure uh, and had been off for about six weeks. And so uh, Brother Decker has had to pick up a lot of his classes too. So. He, he's been running like a, a crazy man, just trying to get, plus then winding down the end of the year, getting graduation ready, and all, a lot of things going on. And him and his wife take the ensemble, and uh, they do a, a tour out when they can uh, to travel to churches and, and uh, basically promote the, the college. So lots going on. But on Thursday, uh, the 12th, Brother Morrison, who was just with us here for our anniversary Sunday, uh, Brother Robbie uh, will be uh, preaching there uh, Thursday night for their Bible conference. And then uh, Friday uh, morning, they have their alumni meeting and then also uh, activities there. And then uh, Friday night, the graduation. So I ask that you just pray uh, for that coming up on the May 12th and uh, 13th. Okay, And uh, hopefully as they kind of wind down for this year and then look forward to uh, filling in some of those vacancies and whatnot for next year. Amen. All right, I'm going to have you take your Bible tonight, and uh, we want to go back. We've been talking about the different doctrines here, what does the Bible say, and uh, we've, I've got a few more things I'd like to bring to light uh, in our teaching on the subject of the Son of God. We've been talking about the, the Godhead, the Trinity, talked about the Father, we talked about the Son, we talked a little bit in between uh, about the Holy Spirit, and uh, there's another area that I'd like to address uh, before we say we're kind of get out away from the, the subject here of the Trinity, but tonight I'd like to focus for a few moments here uh, 
in the subject area of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll come back, as I want to bring some emphasis later uh, on another area of concerning the Son. We went over the offices, his names, and various things, um, and, and we just kind of hit the surface of it. But I want us to go back to the book of Ephesians tonight. And uh, if you follow with me here, we're going to go to Ephesians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're also going to uh, look at several other passages as time will permit us, but for our starting point here tonight, I'd like to go to Ephesians chapter 2, because we have looked at some of the other passages uh, dealing with the Trinity and uh, how the, the Scriptures relate to some of those things. So we've kind of, like I say, they kind of dovetail together when you're talking about the Trinity. It's awful hard to talk about the Trinity without talking about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they sometimes overlap, but then we are focusing on the third person of the Trinity tonight. What I want to talk about, the third person of the Trinity, which we know as the Holy Spirit. The person of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we see the term used as the Holy Ghost. Don't let that term scare you. Sometimes we have our, uh, we, get our we get a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit uh, shy or maybe insecure about using the term because of the charismatics have taken the term and kind of got crazy with it. And so, of course, when we start talking about the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit and those sort of things, uh, if we're not careful, we allow the truth of the Word of God to go uh, and kind of be pushed back just because somebody has exploited it and taken it in the wrong direction or, or taught false things. And that's why we're actually teaching what does the Bible say so that we know the truth, and it's important for us to look at those uh, from the light of the Word of God. And so we should not be ashamed or, or uh, afraid of using the term. Uh, we, we actually, as Bible believers, uh, had the Holy Spirit and talked about being Spirit-filled and all those things long before the Charismatics even knew there was a Holy Spirit, okay? So uh, nonetheless, uh, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, if you would. And <clears throat> I want us to... Uh, I know you're familiar with the passage, and uh, in the beginning it talks about the sinful state of man, and he says, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. He says, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit of the, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Verse 8 says, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. That at the time, that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promises, and having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh, for through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. 
Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, I read down through that chapter to give us, again, a little bit of a background because he's taken us from that, the natural state of man in his sinful state away from God. He says, you are not even able to claim the promises of God because the promises of God were given to God to Abraham and his descendants. Moses giving the law to the children of Israel, and therefore they were the ones who received the promise of God. That promise was given to them because they were the chosen people of God. The Gentiles outside of that had no claim to those promises. Therefore, they had no promise, they had no hope, and uh, because of that, he says, you were alienated from the, and were enemies and, and, and away from God. But he said, but what did he do? He said, he's made both one. He's te- tore down that middle wall, that petition. He talked about there in the one verse we were reading down through it. It says that as we, um, the covenants and the promises that were given, he said that there was given there to those who are called the circumcision in the flesh. He's talking about the Jews because that that covenant that God gave there uh, to Abraham and his descendants, certainly. And then also he says, but you are called the uncircumcision. That's the Gentiles. So he makes that distinction there between them. And he talks about that classification and how that we were separated and, uh, and, and we were without hope and without God. But what's he done? He says, but he took the Jews and the Gentiles and now they're one in Christ. Well, what makes that possible? How can an unsaved person who in times past are dead in their sin able to come and be a part of the family of God? It's because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, first of all. The Holy Spirit of God convicts our heart, draws us, and there's lots of things that we've already previously talked about in other messages, uh, talking about the Trinity and just kind of hitting a little highlight in some of those other times about the Holy Spirit. But there's many things that take place and how that the Holy Spirit is involved in that regenerating act to bring us to that point of conviction. And then uh, he says, by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. That's a gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we see that these different aspects of even our salvation is brought about by the person of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit has some function and some specific things that we see that takes place in all of this. Down in verse 18 of the passage that we just read, It says, through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. And so, praise the Lord, because it is the Holy Spirit that gives us access to the Father. We come, and there's one spirit. And there's not uh, uh, multiple ways, just as there is only one way to the Father, and there's only one way to heaven. Amen? There's one spirit. And and so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, again, sometimes folks get a little bit... um, I don't know if I'm using the right word, but you get a little bit weirded out. It's like the spirit, you know. It's like, oh, there's a spirit. Uh, it shouldn't be something that we should be afraid of or or, or uh, uncertain about. But we can have confidence in when we know what the scripture is talking about when we talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not merely an influence, though. Some people have the idea that the Holy Spirit is just this uh, kind of detached and and just an influence that's out here. Uh, he's not. Uh, merely uh, the Lord's Spirit, uh, in the sense like some people would say, like man's spirit. You know, there's, there's like, you know, we got the spirit of, uh, of man. And uh, man's spirit is never uh, said to be separate person in himself. In other words, we don't have a separate person when we talk about a man and his spirit. You know, that the spirit of man is not separate. Uh, but yet the Holy Spirit we're talking about the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Spirit of God. To look at the Trinity, we find that there's the three personages, what we call the personage of the Father, Father God. We got the Son. The Son is God. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And they are one, and yet each of them have their separate identities and person, and we see the person of the Holy Spirit. It's important that we understand that because later on, when we talk about the Holy Spirit a little bit, about the filling of the Spirit and so forth, uh, there are those that, I guess, get the idea that you get the Holy Spirit in increments, you know? 
and I've, I've said to you, I'm getting ahead of myself tonight, but I've said to you many times, it's not that we get more of the Holy Spirit. We get all the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get when we get saved. The moment we got saved, we got filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, what we need is for the Holy Spirit to have more of us. and We need to yield to Him. And so the Holy Spirit, uh, we see it as the person of the Godhead. Again, there is Father, the Father is God. Uh, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and we know that the three divine persons are one God. Now, this is a great mystery, and we've said this before uh, in our study here, talking about what does the Bible say about the Trinity. Uh, and it's, it's one of those mysteries sometimes that is maybe hard for us to comprehend totally. But at the same time, there are greater mysteries in, in life and around us that we look at, and we have no understanding of it, but we accept and, uh, for example, some of the simple little things, as you think about uh, right now, this time of the year, as the trees are all coming alive again, and they're starting to bud, and you see they're, getting, they're going from that kind of grayish, dull color to, you know, they're getting life and they're getting green, and uh, the leaves are starting to come out, and certain ones are budding, eventually those uh, of the fruit of that tree, whether it's just a leaf or if it actually produces fruit like apples and that sort of thing, a fruit-bearing tree. All of those things begin to come about. You look at that tree, and you see the bark, and then you see the blooms that are coming on, the foliage, the blossoms. And we look at that and we go, how does that all happen? And how is it that you can cut a tree and you can look at those rings and you can tell about the history of that tree and how it grew, and, and yet how did that all just happen? We can't explain it, but we know it happens. And then you look at the, as that tree is growing, how does that bark grow? It's kind of, kind of like the bark grows and expands with the tree, and, and then the inner rings and everything, you know what I'm saying? It's just, there's a lot of mystery there. Now, you might be a whole lot smarter and, and being able to be a conservationist and go in and look at the foliage and look at the leaves, and that was something that I always was amazed with Margaret and Kevin whenever our kids were in the, <coughs> school here, and they would have a <coughs> excuse me, a project, and they'd have to gather leaves. <coughs> Margaret would take them out in the woods someplace and come back with about 25 or 30 different varieties of leaves, and they would have to tell about each tree and what it was, and, and uh, she could rattle them all off to you. She would just be able to say, this is this, and this is that, and so forth and so on. And, uh, and sometimes they would lay them out on a piece of wax paper and press them, and they would have a display and all that. And uh, some you know, even with all of that, sometimes you can look at that and go, wow, isn't that beautiful? But explain to me, how does it do that? How, how, does, the, how does it lay dormant there all winter, and then in the spring as it starts to have that sap going back through and drawing the nutrients out of the ground and cause that tree to blossom and bloom and do what it does? That's a miracle. That's, a, that's, that's the, the work of God, amen? Now, if that's not enough for you, I want you to think about this one. We think about the mysteries of our body. Um, when Brother um, John was here a couple Wednesdays ago talking about his injured foot, and he was talking about the gentleman that was a foot doctor down in Texas that he had known years ago, and sometimes they get the chance to fellowship together, and he helped him. And he was telling him about like a hundred and some odd different parts of the bones that you have in your foot. Now, some of you have probably discovered some of them along the way when you've stubbed your toe and so forth, but unless you really studied the structural, skeletal structure of that foot for whatever reason, you probably didn't realize you had a hundred different bones in your foot, you know? You just look at it and you go, let's see, are all my toes there? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. And uh, is my ankle working today? Yeah, okay. Can I get my shoe on? <laughs> is it too swollen? Amen. Um, but as you think about the mystery of, of the body and how, how wonderfully made we are, you know, David said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. And yet the function of the body, and that's what Brother John was 
uh, Brother John Albert was preaching on here a couple weeks ago was the body working together in harmony and having that function. And yet, when you think about it, the way our human body takes our food. Now, you, whatever you eat, you know, and you take that food in and that nourishment, kind of like that tree out there planted, it's sucking up the nourishment out of the ground, but you're eating, and when you're eating that nourishment, it's helping all of that body function take place. And you think about how that your body will digest that and then break down that food so that it can send it out and make bone. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help your bone structure, or it's going to reproduce your flesh and your skin. Those of you that maybe have you know, gotten a sore, uh, you know, William was saying tonight, he had a blister. Well, he, he got a rub there, and that blister came up. And in time, what's happening? It's going to be sore for a little while, but it's the way the body heals itself. It reproduces that skin and will eventually cover it over. It'll get a little callus there, won't it? And, and, and the same thing as our body. Uh, I, I know for some of us tonight, you know, how is it that you eat that cheeseburger and it produces hair? or your nails. Now, if I thought cheeseburgers in themselves was going to make my hair better, I would be like wimpy. And I would be having, can I get a hamburger today? I'll gladly pay you on Tuesday for a hamburger today type thing. I mean, I would, I would be doubling up on the, on the cheeseburgers if, if I thought that that's... But the serious side of that is what we eat then is going to affect. Now, Rachel is a beautician, and she could tell you that certain things that in the growth of hair and nails and that sort of thing. And it probably has a time period. I know we always have said that, you know, uh, uh, the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is about three days. Well, you can get a really bad haircut in about three days. It starts growing back and you can kind of fix it up and do whatever, you know, sometimes. Uh, sometimes the kids get the scissors and, well, we can only do whatever we can do. And Rachel's saying is, I am a beautician, not a magician. Amen? But sometimes she does do some amazing things. But it'll take so long then, uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, I didn't ask you ahead of time, but on an average, do you know, Rachel, when you have ladies that come to do their nails and they do a manicure or whatever and, and you have to work with their nails, what, does, what is the average growth? Uh, on an average, just throw something out at me. Okay, so about every two weeks, or they're about, their nails are growing, and therefore they need to do fillers, or if they're doing nails, and I'm not trying to get too technical, but basically on about an every two week or so period, the body is going through that process of redeveloping those nails. Am I correct in saying that? Okay, should give me a thumbs up back here. All right, so but how does that do that? So how is it that we eat those things? And, and obviously there's certain things when you know nutrition, and I'm not trying to get sidetracked here too far tonight on all this, but if you have certain nutrition, it's going to help those things happen. If you have bad nutrition, then that's why certain things don't happen, all right? And so certain things will help to stimulate nail growth, hair growth, uh, those sort of things. But how does that happen? Now, think about this. How is it that you can have a black and white cow out in the field eating green grass make you white milk, then we can put some strawberry color in it or chocolate, and we can use that to build our bones and our nails. You know, how is it that we digest that and that calcium and stuff then causes that growth I, through our system to be able to, you know, to produce those things? What I'm saying to you in a nutshell is, is that's a mystery we don't maybe... I mean, we could go to some technical things and we could go to the medical facts and nutrition and we could say, all right, those may be the facts, but how does it happen? How does that, how's that process take place? And for most of us, it happens and we don't even think about it. And my point is that that is one of those mysteries that we don't maybe understand the mode of certain things producing the wood on a tree, the blossoms and the flowers, uh, how things bud and come about, how are bone marrow made and, and skin and hair and nails and all that. And yet these are mysteries, but we believe them very freely 
though we do not understand the process of how that develops. We just accept it. Why is it so hard for us then to accept something like the Trinity that the Bible speaks of and to understand that? Now let me go back to say to you also that Webster's Dictionary defines the Trinity as the union of three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one Godhead, so that all uh, of the three are one God as to substance, but three persons as to individuality. So they each have that their own person of the, of the Godhead. So we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each of them having certain functions that individually separate from the other, but yet one in, in their substance and certainly in their being. And so as we see the Holy Spirit's relationship tonight, here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. And then down in the last verse there, verse 22 of that chapter, it says, In whom we as also are built together, speaking about that building fitly framed together in verse 21, he says we have the Christ as the cornerstone, we're like that foundation that's been laid, and now we have the building you and I are part of that building being fitly framed together. Verse 22 of Ephesians 2, verse 22, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that helps us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit that brings Scripture to mind. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us to, uh, to, uh, to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and to, to have those things. Uh, the, for our spiritual growth. So the Holy Spirit's relationship with the Father, and there's a Holy Spirit's relationship with the Son. And the Bible passages speak of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God, and sometimes as the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father and the Son, yet He is also distinct in Himself, has His own, as we call the person of the Holy Spirit, and uh, has <clears throat> uh, various things. That's what I want to touch on here for a few moments uh, tonight as well. Uh, notice if you would with me, let's just make a maybe a marker here. We may come back uh, to Ephesians here. Matter of fact, tell you what, while we're here, let's just go ahead. I'll, I'll backtrack here in a second. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. I wanted to look at Ephesians 4. Might as well do it while we're here. Ephesians 4, and then maybe we just make reference back. Ephesians chapter 4, and Lord willing, we'll eventually get to Romans here in a minute. But right now, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, Notice, if you would, beginning here in uh, verse 1, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Verse 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So he emphasizes here again, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's there, one God, amen, but we also see there's the Spirit. And, uh, and a part of the Trinity that we see. Let me go back, if you would, now to Matthew. We're going to just—I'm uh, going to give you several references real quick tonight, for time's sake. We won't spend a lot of time here, but Matthew chapter 28. You know this in what we call the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we know that he tells us that after the resurrection, that Jesus tells us to go in all the world and preach the gospel. But you'll notice what does he tell us in Matthew 28? Down in verse uh, 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore. Because we have power, because the authority is given to Christ, he tells us that we have that authority to go. He says, Go ye. It's not a, if you like to, it's a command. It's what we call the Great Commission. He commands us to go. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. There it is. Now, I remind you, I said a little while ago, at the beginning of our study tonight, that the Holy Spirit, the term is used, or the Spirit of Christ, or the term the Holy Ghost. Don't be afraid of that term. It shouldn't cause us to say, oh, I, 
don't know about the Holy Ghost. That sounds something too mysterious. Uh, it's what we find that Christ tells us that part of the Great Commission is that we are to go and to baptize in the name of the Father and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So we see that he, the Holy Spirit is one with the Father. And yet we see that he's also uh, distinct in, in himself. The Holy Spirit is called the person and does the work of a person. Uh, notice, if you would, back in the Gospel of John with me. Now, there's m multiple other verses tonight, and we won't be able to hit them all. But uh, let's go to John for just a moment. <clears throat> John chapter 14. John chapter 14, if you would. <clears throat> Actually, the next four or five chapters here in the Gospel of John, it would do you good to go back and read uh, through these chapters, John 14 through about 17. There's a lot here in, in these chapters dealing with the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. But in John 14, notice down in the passage here, John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. He says, And I will pray the Father... He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Notice the word comforter is capitalized there. It's a proper name of the Holy Spirit. He says that he's called the comforter. And he says, I'll pray and the Father will send another comforter. Notice in verse 17 it says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth in, with you, and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Now, we see that he tells us here that he's going to send the Comforter. We sing that song, the Comforter has come. Amen? Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is uh, come, and he seals us. And that's one of the things uh, that the Holy Spirit does, but uh, we see that he comes and abides with us, and You'll notice that he says there uh, in verse 16, he says that he may abide with you forever. Amen. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come and empower an individual for service and then leave. In the New Testament here, we see that he tells us that the Holy Spirit, the, the functionality of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit comes to the believer, brings conviction, brings us to the understanding of the Scriptures, opens up our knowledge so that we can by grace be saved, and then he seals us under the day of redemption, and he is, his presence abides with us forever. So praise the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit. He, he is with us forever, as he says. And uh, he says, and I will not leave you comfortless. Uh, and praise the Lord that we have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there to be our comforter. And uh, we see that part of his function or the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring comfort. Notice down in this passage, down, skip down to verse 26, the same passage, uh, John 14, verse 26. It says, but the Comforter, again, you notice it's capitalized. Here's a proper name. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. Now, if you were wondering, okay, so up in verse 16, he says, I will give you another Comforter. Well, who is that, Jesus? Well, if you read the Scriptures, you find that the Scriptures will interpret itself. And here we find in verse 27, or excuse me, verse uh, 26, he says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, amen? So there is the answer. Well, who is the Comforter up in verse uh, 16? It's the Holy Ghost. Because he tells us in verse 26 who the Comforter is. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit is not only there to convict us, but to comfort us. Amen? And he is going to bring that comfort, which then brings peace. The presence of the Holy Spirit of God is that we can have that peace of God. He says, I'm not giving you the kind of peace that the world speaks about. He says, not like the world gives. Am I given to you? He said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. It is the presence of the Holy Spirit that helps us when times of fear come upon us, when we are troubled, and uh, he can give us peace. Amen. 
And so here we find that the work of the Holy Spirit is to work in our life to bring about that comfort and help that we need as well as that comfort. Uh, notice, if you would, let's go over to uh, chapter 15 for just a moment. John chapter 15. <clears throat> Excuse me, John 15. Kind of staying with this same thought here for just another moment. John 15, down verse 25. It says, but this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that it is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye, sh ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So we find then that the next thing that he's talking about is that the Holy Spirit comes from the Father. The Holy Spirit is separate from the Father, but in agreement with the Father and part of the Godhead. And that he's also the one who's going to come to testify to us, so he bears witness with us. But then why does he bear witness with us? So that we can be a witness for God. So the Holy Spirit's job is not just so that we can come and get convicted. As you know, we hear the preaching of the Word of God, and we go, man, that bothered me. I, I, feel, I feel like guilty about something. Well, if the Holy Spirit's convicting us, then we can deal with it. And we go to the altar, we get things right, we, we, we confess to the Lord, we, we, we come and pray, and we, uh, you know, we yield to God, we, we become obedient to those things. And, uh, and as we do that, then we, we come back to the, hey, you know what, I've got the presence of the Lord. I feel at peace. And so when I'm at peace then, now he bears witness with me that I am at peace. And when I'm at peace, that witness now helps me to be a witness. Amen. It's awful hard to be talking uh, you know, to people about the Lord. And first of all, if you don't know the Lord, amen, you got to have the Lord. So the Holy Spirit has to bring about salvation in our life. That's part of his work of regeneration. He, he works in our lives to bring us to that place of salvation. But then... How, how can we talk about how good God is and be a witness if we've not experienced ourself? And if we, so as he bears witness in our life, we are able then to be that witness that he wants us to be so that in turn we can tell others about Christ. And so we can bear that witness. Now, in both of those passages, I, it's hard for me, I don't want to get sidetracked, but this is what I was trying to get at a little bit ago when our, our, our brilliant Homeland Security Director is talking about having this board of truth, and to be able to have some kind of, of a, um, um, they're going to find out disinformation. So they want to have, you know, if somebody says something that's, that they think is inaccurate, they're going to classify it as disinformation and then try to eliminate from social media and so all these different things and so forth and so on. And, and just even when they say that, I'm like, Wow, this is crazy talk. Uh, we have people that are coming here across our southern border right now trying to get away from third world countries where they already have that. It's called coming to America for the freedom of speech <laughs> and the First Amendment. And uh, that's why some of these people want to come. Uh, and yet, you know, they're fleeing communism and all that stuff, and they're finding out that America is going that way. Anyhow, another, another t topic at another time. But... Here we notice that he talks about what is part of the job of the Holy Spirit. It's, he mentions him as even the spirit of truth. Amen? He is that one that bears the truth. He's the one that witnesses to us. He bears that truth in our heart. And, we, and, and he tells us then that, that he's going to teach us all things, that, as we read there in, uh, down in chapter 14 a moment ago, verse 26. Again, just remind you, he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So he is that teacher. He's going to teach us in all truth. And so when we know the truth, Jesus said the truth will set us free. He, he's, that's what makes us free, amen. And, uh, and that's why some folks, by the way, don't like the truth. Uh, they want to keep people uh, away from the truth because then if folks are free, then they don't need them. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> You know, there are some people that want folks to be dependent upon them. That way they still have a job. And, uh, and so, you know, when people need them, uh, and they can keep them suppressed and whatever, but yet when you come to the truth, it sets you free. Amazing, isn't it? Holy Spirit is one with the Father, 
and with the Son, and yet he is also distinct. We see that the Holy Spirit is called a person and does the work of a person. We notice that also in, uh, back in John chapter 16. While here in John, go to John 16. Down in the passage here in John chapter 16. And notice if you would, uh, beginning here in verse 7. Notice here he goes in a little bit of detail, again, about the work of the Holy Spirit. John, se- uh, John 16 verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. Now, Jesus is saying, hey, I, I want you, he's telling his disciples before he goes to Calvary, I must go away. But notice what he says. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When Jesus was here, the Holy Spirit could not come and do that work of the comfort. Jesus was here to be that comfort. And now he says, but I must go away, and the Lord will send another comforter. And he says, now I must do this, it's expedient that I go away, but that the comfort will come. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Verse 8 says, and when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I would say that that is a great truth that we need to be reminded. I was telling somebody uh, the other day, we were talking a moment about ministry, and they were saying, uh, congratulations, pastor, 35 years of ministry, and so forth and so on. And I said, yeah, isn't it something how the Lord can teach us and help us <clears throat> to direct us? I go back 35-plus years ago. Let me go back 40-some years ago. If the Lord would have told me everything that was going to happen you know, in the next 40 plus years after I got saved, he wouldn't have had to worry about sending me to be your father. Man, I'd have, been, <laughs> I'd have been running someplace else fast, amen? As it was, even having the Lord working in my life over a couple year period, I was kind of running from that idea anyhow. But man, I'm glad that he doesn't dump it all on us at once because we wouldn't be able to handle it. What's he saying here? I have many things to say unto you. He's talking to his disciples, but ye cannot bear them now. There's a lot of things in your life right now that you're able to bear, but there's things the Lord wants to tell you that he can't tell yet because you're not ready yet. You can't bear it. You're not in a point where you can bear that news or that information that he wants to give you and that eventually you will need, but if he gave it to you all at once, it'd just be too much for you to comprehend and, and to take in and you would not be able to bear it. So what's he doing? He's withholding certain knowledge Certain things that they need to know. He says, I'm not going to tell you yet. Now, I'll tell you, but not yet. You're not ready for it. And what's he saying in verse 13? How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of the disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father... They said, therefore, what is this that he saith? A little while. We cannot tell what he saith. Isn't it interesting? Here's Jesus. He just got through telling them in verse 12, I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear it. They're probably thinking, oh, come on, come on. Well, let us know. And then when he starts to tell them, and he's basically saying, soon I'm going to Calvary, and you're not going to see me a while. And then a little while, you'll see me again, talking about the resurrection. And they can't even comprehend that. <laughs> you know? And they're like, what's he talking about? A little while. What's, he, what's that mean? And, and what, we, we cannot tell what, he, what he's talking about. In verse 19, now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said a little while? And ye shall not see me, and again, a little while, ye shall see me. He said, <laughs> you know, we were just talking about having knowledge 
uh, you guys don't even understand what I just said, that I am trying to show you, that I am revealing this, to, this truth to you, and you can't comprehend it. How can I give you the deep things, the greater things, the greater knowledge of, of the plan and the purpose of God? How can, I, how can I impart that to you when you can't even get past this one yet? And so he says in verse 20, he says, Verily, verily, or very truly here, truly, truly, verily I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she hath, is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now, therefore, have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day ye shall ask in my name, and I say, uh, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I am come, came out of the, uh, from God, and I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverbs. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. And Jesus answered them and said, Do ye now believe? <laughs> you know, in it, 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 who, who thinks God doesn't have a sense of humor? Come on. You know what he just did there? It's the same thing that if you think back in the previous chapters when he's telling Peter. Peter's like, Oh, Lord, I'm ready to die. And he says, Peter, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And as we sit here on Sunday night, when he's on when he's, uh, John 21, when He's got them on the shore there, and they got all the fishes. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? You know, the Lord knew what Peter was going to do. And, and, and through it, here the disciples are, oh, now we understand. Now you're not speaking to us in Proverbs. You, you have showed us, and now we believe. We understand and know that you've come from God. And then Jesus kind of looks at him and says, do you really? <laughs> are you sure about that? <laughs> because he knows what's about to happen. He knows that he's going to Calvary, and he's already told them, you're all going to forsake me. You're going to, and then you're going to be hiding up in the upper room for fear of the Jews. And then remember uh, how that in John 20 it says that they went to the sepulcher and found it empty, and they believed not. They couldn't believe it. It was like, what? What does this mean? They, and they, now here they're telling him, oh, yeah, we really believe. Thou came from, the, from God. And he says, and now you believe, Right? Behold, the hour cometh, verse 32, while we're here, uh, verse 32 says, The hour cometh and is now come that ye shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Think how powerful that statement is. We've, we've, we've heard messages on that many times in the context of Jesus talking about the comforter coming and having peace in the world, and we're going to have tribulation, he says, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The statement is put out there at the same time when the disciples are seemingly saying, oh yeah, now we understand who you are, we know you're come from God, and we understand all this, okay. And he says, well, there's many things I'd like to teach you, but you're not able to bear it yet, you're not ready. And but that's going to be what the Holy Spirit's going to do. After I'm gone, the Comforter will come, and he will teach you all things. He will be the Spirit of truth. Amen? He will be that one who guides you in all truth. He will direct you, and he will lead you. And he says, now the day is coming, and he actually says, the hour cometh that, that you're all going to be scattered. Not too long from now, you're going to be scattered everywhere, and you're going to leave me alone. But what's he say? But yet I'm not alone. Now that ought to encourage our hearts to realize tonight that that, again, that the Spirit of, uh, 
has come to comfort Christ, when you go back to Matthew chapter 4, and we see the temptation of Christ there, what we talk about the temptation of Christ when he's taken out by the devil, and it says, though, that the Spirit of God, that Christ, I'm kind of mixing up the quote here, but basically it says that at that time, Christ was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Most of us would go, hey, uh, I don't want to go out there in the wilderness, you know. But this was the proving point in a place where he was going to go. And then it says after that time of temptation, and Christ uh, certainly came through and passed all that by quoting the scriptures back to Satan. And uh, it says that after the temptation was all done and everything, that he was left there and the Spirit ministered unto him. And so now we see that uh, certainly the Holy Spirit is going to be the one who he says, well, even though you all are going to forsake me, you're going to leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone. Why? Because the Father and the Spirit and the Son are one. And yet separate as individual personalities, the personage, the duties and responsibilities, the, the title, the acts that, that, that they do, uh, and yet in agreement in one here. And so the person of Christ is saying, hey, you're going to leave me alone. I won't be alone. And then, if we tie that into the fact that he says, the Holy Spirit will come and he will be with you forever. What does he tell us in Hebrews? He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. So praise the Lord. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that Jesus knows what it is to say, I'm going to be left alone. But I'm going to make it possible that you'll never be left alone. I'm going to eventually, we know that he was hanging on the cross, that... Uh, he cries out to the Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he takes that shame and pain of uh, everything there, and, and yet he bore that so that you and I would not have to be alone. The Holy Spirit's job is to come and to seal us, and he'll abide with us forever, he said. He's our teacher, he's our comforter, and uh, we see that the personage there. We know that the Holy Spirit has his own feelings, as we read there uh, a moment ago back in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, and and. I don't have to turn back here again right now. Uh, also, he has his own will. Uh, back in the in the book of Acts, we see that he deals with Acts chapter 13 and also Acts chapter 15. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a will. Matter of fact, let's look at one of those for just time's sake here. Let's go back to Acts 13, I guess. And uh, Acts 13, the book of Acts chapter 13, we'll pick up here real quick. I don't want to spend too much time on each of these, but Acts 13... And here, you'll notice that in Acts 13, what's taking place is that Paul and Barnabas are being set aside, and they are going to be sent out by the church to be the missionaries to take the gospel, and they're going to ordain these men to go out and uh, to represent and take the message. So in Acts 13, verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, uh, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manon, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. You'll notice that it tells us in verse 2 here that the Holy Spirit is the Holy Ghost spoke and said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work where I have called them. These men were called of the Holy Spirit to do this mission work and to take the gospel. God called them. The Holy Spirit of God is the one who chose them and separated them and said, I want you to separate these men. These are the men uh, that are called to do this particular work. So this is the will of the Holy Spirit. We would say it's the will of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. Amen? He's part of what we call the Godhead. So sometimes those terms are all interchangeable because we're speaking about one and the same. And yet we see the distinct thing here of the will of the Holy Spirit was it was the Spirit of God who called these men. Uh, you know, when a man is called to preach the gospel, it is not, you know, I guess when we were in Bible college, we had this saying, that uh, there were some men who were there 
because they were mama called and papa sent. Now, they weren't God called. God didn't call them. The Holy Spirit didn't call them. But mama said, I want my boy to be a preacher. Ah, I want him to be a preacher. And so she sent him off to Bible college, and dad paid for it. So they were mama called and papa sent, but they weren't God called. And so there's a difference. The Holy Spirit calls men into service. The Holy Spirit chooses them, calls them. Being called of God helps, by the way, when the world is beaten on you. <laughs> when the world is against you and all things that we find here that we read a moment ago in the Gospel of John when Jesus said, uh, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Well, how can that help us? Because when you know you're called of God and the Holy Spirit is called, then you can do those things in the world and the things around us that are difficult uh, even in, on a good day. But uh, praise the Lord for the calling here of the Holy Spirit. While we're here, let's go over to Acts 15. Acts chapter 15, just a page maybe from where you're at there. Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> Excuse me, Acts 15. And if you would, skip down with me uh, here in the passage. Let's go down to uh, verse uh, 28. Acts 15 and verse 28 says, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And so we find that in, in the following verses, for time's sake, here you can go back and read it later, they were having a question here as to what the Gentiles were supposed to do under ceremonial law. And at one point in Acts 15, they were coming and saying, wait a minute, uh, you guys are putting more of a burden on the Gentiles to do things that we can't even do as Jews. You know, the, the, we, we don't even fulfill those things, and you want them to do it. And so they were basically saying, you, you're, you know, you're putting a double standard here uh, for a show of some sort. And so what, what we find is in verse 28 is it said, it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. And, then, and so they lay out a few things that said, this is what you need to do uh, and not do. And so it gives them some counsel here. But the point of it was that the counsel was from the Holy Ghost. Amen. And so, again, God's will. Uh, he's not willing that any would perish, but all come to repentance. He's not willing that we put more upon someone than what the Word of God desires or demands. Amen. Uh, well, that's real good. Uh, you can get saved, uh, but then you need to do this and this. And this. We're adding to the grace of God. That's not what the Spirit of God said. And so here we find that the degrees here of this council was brought about by the Holy Ghost, and they said it was good that this is what the Holy Ghost said, and we felt it was good too because he's led us to say, hey, this is what you need to do or not do. So here is the will of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost being presented to us here uh, in Acts chapter 15. Um, notice if you would, uh, let's see, I've got to find my spot here. Go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Not too far from where we're at, just a few pages into 1 Corinthians. Keep going forward here. Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. Amen? Okay, 1 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> we're talking about how the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost has a will, okay, as the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, I want to emphasize again at the beginning, maybe some of you didn't hear this, the Holy Spirit is just not some uh, external influence. It's just an influence. That's not the Holy Spirit. There's the person of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the person of the Holy Spirit. We don't just receive an influence. And here we find in, in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, let's go down again for time's sake here. We're going to kind of jump in the middle of everything. But notice if you would, 1 Corinthians 12, he's talking about the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, verse 6, it says, There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, and another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of the miracles, and to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh the one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. 
Notice what it says there at the end. These are different gifts that God gives to different people, comes from the same spirit, one spirit, but different gifts going to different individuals to do the different tasks as he wills. It is the Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit's will is then that different functions in the body. As we go back to that comparison a little bit ago, we have a body, it functions, and each member is built upon uh, the foundation that we've, we saw there earlier in Ephesians. And so that foundation is laid, and each member has a different function. Our thumb functions differently, as was brought out here a couple weeks ago. If, if you've tried to do something and don't use your thumb, you will find that you're going to have a difficult time. It's amazing how God has put that thumb there to do many tasks. You don't even think about it. Often you just you reach down to grab something, and you pick it up. You have to have that thumb working to do that. Try doing it without using your thumb. I mean, you can do it. But all of a sudden, now you're just using a couple fingers, and now all of a sudden you've got to rearrange your fingers. Well, each, each member has a function. Each member has a gift that it contributes to the body. And that's what he's saying here. The Holy Spirit gives different gifts to the body of Christ, the people of God, to function like a body so that in turn we can do the work of God. And yet there has to be that unity of the body here in verse 12. He says, for as the body is one and, many, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, uh, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. He goes on more here and talks about the members of the body uh, being used and, and unity and so forth. But my point is, is that we see here that he says at the end of that verse, in verse 11, he says that it is the self-same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. So God gives the ability for the thumb to move and, and do certain things that, you know, my little finger, it doesn't turn that way. You know, it, you, know, you know what I'm saying? And thank God my ears are able to be turned this way because I have a hard enough time hearing as it is. But what would happen if they were turned the other way? Amen? If my ear was back this way and I had to hear, I, I might, Yeah. And some of you think mom has eyes in the back of her head. She doesn't really, but somehow she does. <laughs> she, she sees things. She hears things. Amen. But each, each member being of, uh, to be able to function. And so God gives your eyes certain abilities to do things that are different than your ears and so forth. And, uh, that, and, and that comes from the Spirit of God in, in the functioning of, of our, our life as well. And because of that, he has his own feelings. He has his own will. Let me give you one more here very quickly. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. I was going to spend more time here tonight in Romans 8, but our time is about gone, so we'll maybe use this as a kind of a stop-off point. If you go to the book of Romans, if you're in 1 Corinthians, back up just a little bit between Acts and 1 Corinthians, you'll find the book of Romans. Amen. So back up a little bit, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Bear with me just another moment here. All right, Romans 8. We use this as our last thought here tonight. The Holy Spirit's relationship with the Father and the Son. He's not just an influence, but as a person of the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Godhead, of the Trinity. Notice we find here in Romans and chapter 8. Down in the passage, Romans chapter 8. Let's pick up uh, in... Uh, uh, let's go back to verse 23, okay? Romans chapter 8, verse 23, it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with Patience, wait for it. Verse 26 says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity, for we know not what we should pray as for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to to the will of God. In verse 27 of our text that we just read, 
we see that the Holy Spirit has his own mind. The mind of the Holy Spirit. Let's read that verse one more time. Verse 27 says, he's talking about intercession of the Holy Spirit, interceding in our behalf. That's what, he's, what he's talking about there in basic is, is sometimes when we're praying and we say, Lord, I don't even know how to pray about this. This individual's asked me to pray about such and such, and Lord, I don't know how to pray. I mean, I, I want to know what to pray here, Lord. I want to have the mind of God on this. I want to have the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit, you need to lead me to pray in the right way. And sometimes even when we do that, we're still like, I, st I just don't know how to pray. I don't, I don't know what to pray for. I mean, yeah, I could pray this, but is that the will of God? I could pray for this, but, but is that the will of God? Lord, I might even pray for this. And any one of these three might be okay, but which one, Lord, is your will? And I might wind up coming up to that and finally saying, Lord, you know what? I have no idea. Lord, you're going to have to have your will be done. Lord, I'm going to pray that you take these things and you use it as you see fit, and you direct in your will. Now, what am I doing? I'm praying. I'm interceding. But I, you know what? I, I don't know which way to pray. And it's like, I'm not real certain. There's sometimes when I can come along and pray with somebody, and I know in my heart, I don't have to pray about this, this, and this. That's not the will of God. This is the will of God. I know. Because there are certain things in the Scripture that are plain and clear. Oh, preacher, will you pray with me? I'm wondering if I should date this guy or this girl over here who's unsaved and, boy, they're, they're out of way, they're not going to church. I, I'm thinking I should date. I don't have to pray about that. I know what the Bible says. Come out from among them, be a separate, say, Lord. I'm going to pray over here. Lord, open up their eyes that they can see to do the right thing. This is not the right thing. Amen? I don't have to pray if that's the will of God. But there's other things that we might start praying about, and we're like, Lord, how do I pray about this? I don't know which way to go. Any one of these could be okay, but Lord, we want your perfect will. We don't want just your good will. We don't want it just acceptable. I want your perfect will. I want you to do your work. So as we look at this passage in, in uh, Romans chapter 8, he tells us then that in verse 26 that, that uh, let's read it again. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray, for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Holy Spirit takes over. He's like, I'll go before the Father. I'll, 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 I'll be able to present this. But remember, he says, you have not because you ask not. So if you're asking me, Holy Spirit, intercede in my behalf. Holy Spirit, take this before the throne of God. Holy Spirit, I need to <coughs> know the mind of God. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to know the direction here. <coughs> And the Holy Spirit searches and brings about for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Verse 27 again says, And he searches the hearts, and he knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. What is the mind of the Spirit? Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Holy Spirit, is, the person of the Holy Spirit has a mind. What is the mind of the Spirit? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Amen. That Spirit of Christ, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that He would work not only His feelings, His own will, His own mind. The Holy Spirit has His own mind, according to Romans 8, 26 and 27. Praise God that He's able to help us when we're praying, and the intercession is made possible. Amen. And so with that, we're going to stop here for, for tonight. I we'll encourage you, as we study the Scriptures, to find out what does the Bible say. And here tonight we see the Holy Spirit, the person, of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, what we call the Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Those three, yet one. Amen. Father, we ask you now tonight that you would work in our hearts. And again, we thank you, Lord, that we can have the truths of your word uh, to solidify our, uh, our beliefs and to be strengthened in our heart, that we may grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, but also, Lord, that we can give an answer to those that ask us the hope that lieth within us, that we would pray, Father, that you would Help us that, uh, as Jesus said to the disciples, you cannot bear all these things. I want to give you knowledge, but you can't bear it now. And the Holy Spirit will come, and he'll be our teacher. I pray, Holy Spirit, teach us and lead us, direct us, guide us, give us that comfort that is needed. Uh, meet each need tonight. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you'd uh, intercede in our behalf. I pray, Father, that, that truly that your will be done in each and every heart. Guide and direct now and uh, receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. 
And we'll thank you in Jesus' name we pray. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, nobody looking about tonight, I want to give you just an opportunity this evening to take a moment to consider maybe the Holy Spirit might be speaking to somebody tonight about salvation. If you're here and you're not sure heaven's your home, uh, it might be tonight that he would say, hey, why don't you get saved? I don't know, maybe you thought you're saved, but you're not sure. And uh, we'll take the Bible and show you from the Word of God how you can know for sure, without a doubt, and to be able to uh, have that peace that passes all understanding. And you can wait tonight, allow the Holy Spirit to uh, bring you to that point of, of salvation and decision that you might know for sure that heaven's your home. And if you're here this evening and you say, well, preacher, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, but I've been praying about something, I'm not sure uh, what it is the Lord would have me to do. Well, as we just kind of wound up here, the Holy Spirit is a person. Have you talked to him about it? Uh, have you asked him? Have you asked him to show you? Have you asked him to teach you and lead you? Have you asked the Holy Spirit to intervene and, and uh, to intercede? Maybe there's something tonight that you need for him to work in your life and to, to guide you and direct you. Maybe you, you're lacking peace. You know, that's a good indication, by the way. Uh, I've often told folks that when you're praying, if you don't have any peace about it, you better wait. The Holy Spirit will wrestle your spirit, and, and he'll, he'll, he'll bear witness with you, and he'll give you peace. And when you have that peace, you can rest assured then that, okay, I've got a peace about it. I, I, I'm at peace in my heart, and I know that I'm, I'm going forward here uh, in the direction that, that is the right, the right thing, and, and I've been praying about it, and, and i got peace about it. Well, when he gives you peace, then go ahead. If you don't have any peace, if you're lacking that peace, wait till God brings that perfect peace, amen? And the Holy Spirit is there to comfort you. So maybe you're praying about something. Maybe you're waiting on the Lord. Uh, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and uh, we'll give you an opportunity tonight to uh, respond. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. The song tonight I want to use for our invitation. I'm just going to share a couple of verses with you real quick, but it says, Nothing between my soul and the Savior, not of this world's delusive dreams, I have now, or excuse, I have, I have renounced all sinful pleasure. Jesus is mine. There is nothing between. The song says, don't let anything be between you and God. What is it that might be standing in the way, keeping you from serving the Lord? It might be something that keep you from coming to Christ. Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, but nothing between. Do you see the Lord? Is there something in the way between you and him? Something blocking your vision of the Lord. You can't see him. You can't see his face. You're not sure what to do. And maybe you have a lack of peace. It may be the Holy Spirit's trying to guide you and direct you. Are you listening? Do you let the Holy Spirit work? If there's something there, let's get it taken care of. Nothing between, like worldly pleasure, habits of life, though harmless they seem, must not my heart from him ever sever. Keep the way clear. Let nothing between. Nothing between, like pride or station, self or friends shall not intervene. Though it may cost me much tribulation, I am resolved. There's nothing between. Nothing between, even many hard trials. Though the whole world against me convene, watching with prayer and much self-denial, I'll triumph at last with nothing between. What did Jesus say? Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen? Boy, thank God we are triumphant at last. When we have nothing between, yes, nothing between my soul and the Savior, so that his blessed face may be seen, nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. Amen? Father, we ask you tonight that you would take your word now, challenge our hearts, I ask you, Father, to watch over us as we travel. Give us safety tonight upon the highway. Protect from danger seen and unseen. I pray you give each one a special blessing for being here this evening. Help us to be more conscientious and, and sensitive to the leading of your Holy Spirit in our life. To think that he is with us always, everywhere we go, everything we do, that the Holy Spirit is there to guide us and direct us, to teach us, to speak to us, to give us peace in our heart to stir our hearts and to convict us when we're wrong or when we're out of place. I pray that we would be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit working in our life. That, Father, that you would bring about certainly the, the, your will and uh, that your will be accomplished in our lives. And uh, we'll praise and give you the glory for what you do. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, take a few moments uh, to greet one another. And uh, don't forget, uh, back here on the Lord's Day, 
for Mother's Day celebration on Sunday. Bring, bring a mom or a grandma or an aunt, a sister, someone. Amen. Adopt somebody for the day. Amen. All right. God bless you.